Uh, good evening, everyone, and good morning to Professor Fukushima, Tokyo time. Uh, greetings from Tokyo, and good evening to colleagues in Denver. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, let's get started. Uh, my name is Ahmed Abdurabu. I'm the director of the U.S.-Japan uh, Diplomacy Program. And uh, today uh, we have a 90-minute discussion on the Japan's new national security strategy and uh, how can that impact the future of the Sino-Japan relations, future of Japan-China relations. Uh, uh, let me just put this in context. Uh, we started last week our first uh, activity of the program in this academic year uh, by speaking or covering three of the most important documents issued by Tokyo uh, last December. And uh, the three documents are the Japan, the, what's called New Japan National Security Strategy, New Japan uh, uh, Defense Policy, and finally the Military Buildup Program. And the three documents, even though they are issued by two different uh, two different uh, policy organizations in, in Japan, but they are very connected and they are defining or redefining the Japan's national security and defense policy uh, in the coming in the coming years. And as soon as Japan declared the three new documents, actually, that was somehow igniting different and contradicting reactions and debate from uh, uh, different countries, different scholars. Uh, some have described this as uh, Japan's violation to its very long history of uh, pacifist defense policy defined by Article 9 of the Japan 1946 Constitution. Some, mainly here in the United States, welcomed, highly welcomed the new policy, um, uh, thinking that this Japan is going exactly the right direction. So today, uh, join me in welcoming two of uh, very distinguishing uh, guests. Uh, first, from Tokyo, we have Professor uh, Akiko Fukushima. Uh, Professor Fukushima is a senior fellow at the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research with a PhD degree from Osaka University and MA uh, from the Paul Netze School of Advanced International Studies, John Hopkins University. And her, uh, her career includes a professor at School of Global Studies and Collaboration, uh, Aoyama Gakuin University, and director of policy studies at the National Institute for Research Advancement. Currently, Professor Fukushima is a member of the International Advisory Board of the Hague Journal of Diplomacy and non-resident fellow at the Lowy Institute. She has served on the Japanese on J different Japanese government committees, and her publications include Japanese Foreign Policy, The Emerging Logic of Multilateralism, but uh, issued uh, printed by uh, uh, Macmillan, 1999, and also Multilateralism Recalibrated in Post-War Japan, uh, published by the CSIS in 2017. And she has contributed chapters to edited volumes, including A New Logic of Multilateralism on Demand, uh, and that was actually published by uh, Belle Grave in 2023. This is very recent. And she has also contributed articles to journals, including Reshaping the United Nations with Concept of Human Security, version two, uh, uh, published by Strategic Analysis in October of 2020, and also uh, from the Asia Pacific to the Indo Pacific its motives, aims, and future, and that was published in 2021. 20, uh, and next to me, I shouldn't call him guest, of course, he's not, uh, Professor <laughs> Professor Soi Xing Zhao. Uh, he is a professor and director of the Center for China-US uh, Cooperation here at Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, University of Denver. He is the founder and editor of the Journal of Contemporary China and the author and editor of more than two dozen of books. His most recent book is the Dragon Roars Back, Transformational Leaders and Dynamics of Chinese Foreign Policy. And that was actually published by Stanford University Press last year, 2022. 
and a postdoctoral uh, Campbell National Fellow at Hoover Institution of Stanford University. He received his PhD degree in political science from the University of California, San Diego, and uh, MA degree in sociology from the University of Missouri, and also BA and MA degrees in economics from Peking University. And I also, I have to mention that uh, Professor Zhao was uh, kind enough to accept my invitation, even though he was supposed to be today in Hong Kong, I guess, <laughs> but he was very uh, kind to me and kind to the center and kind to the Institute uh, for Comparative and Regional uh, Studies to uh, be here today. Thank you very much. And yeah, with that said, uh, our our program today is going to be 25 to 30 minutes uh, talk by both Professor Fukushima and Professor Zhao. And we will then open the talk for, I mean, open the floor for uh, Q&A and open discussion. So Professor Fukushima, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening to colleagues in Denver. I would like to thank uh, Professor Abdrabo for your kind invitation to join the seminar. As requested, I will speak on the new Japan's National Security Strategy, NSS, and also uh, talk on our relations with uh, other countries, certainly including China. I very much look forward to the discussion with uh, Professor Abdurabo as well as Professor Zhao and other colleagues gathered here today. Let me qualify that points I will share with you today are purely my personal academic view. As uh, has been already introduced, on December 16, 2022, the Japanese government announced the three new strategic documents, namely National Security Strategy, NSS, with the National Defense Strategy and Defense Buildup Program. They are all together about 100 pages long, and I cannot do justice to the whole documents in a limited time given, but will do my best to extract some uh, key points in my view, focusing on the NSS as requested. The 2022 NSS is the first revision since 2013 when the first NSS was announced. As a matter of fact, I participated in drafting the 2013 NSS. Meanwhile, the National Defense Strategy, NDS, is the first document with this title modeled after US NDS. The NDS replaces National Defense Program Guidelines, NDPG, and it was first published in 1976, and the latest revision was in 2018. The National Def Defense Buildup Program replaces the medium term defense program, which had been in place since 1986 and was upgraded every five years. Now, why has Japan announced the new NSS last December? Let me give three factors. The first and foremost is the assessment of the increasingly severe security environment Japan faces. Many factors regarded as risks back in 2013 have now evolved into clear and imminent danger. Historical changes in power balances and intensifying geopolitical competitions have changed the security scene drastically. Japan's security environment is as severe and complex as it has ever been since the end of the World War II. As an illustration, Japan faces three neighbors who own and develop nuclear weapons. That is, frequent test launches by missiles by North Korea, including ICBMs, threaten Japan and Japanese public. Some of North Korean missiles have landed within the exclusive economic zone, EEZ, of Japan. Most lately, on February 18, 2023, that is last month, the ICBM North Korea launched landed 200 kilometers west of Toshima Oshima in Hokkaido, certainly within the EEZ. 200 kilometers is comparable to the distance between LA and San Diego, or between 
Denver and Pebro, I think. When the J alert rings at our smartphones, informing us to be careful of uh, missiles, the Japanese public is certainly scared combined with North Korean nuclear development. Although the threat perception on North Korea remains from 2013, against the backdrop of North Korean rapid development of missile-related technology and frequent test launches of missiles towards Japan, the 2022 NSS says that North Korea is a grave and more eminent threat to Japan's national security than before. As for another neighbor, Russia, its invasion to Ukraine since February last year is perceived not someone else's problem, but is our problem. It is perceived as an act to change the status quo by force, violating the international law and undermining sovereignty and territorial integrity. There is also a threat a possible use of nuclear weapons by Russia. While in 2013, the NSS saw Russia as a potential asset for peace and stability in the Asia Pacific and called for cooperation with Russia in all areas, including engagement, of, uh, engagement for resolution on disputed islands in Japan's north. The 2022 NSS said that Russia is a dangerous spoiler whose aggression against Ukraine has breached the very foundation of the rules that shape the international order. It also expressed serious, serious security concern on Russia's strategic collaboration with China. Japan is concerned that China and Russia have recently increased their joint or happens to be joint navigation and flights for patrol around the Japanese archipelago. Now our neighbor China. Japan in 2013 was more attuned to security challenges posed by China than much of the rest of the Western world, and its language in the NSS was therefore uh, careful focusing on concerns over China's military activities and lack of transparency in its military affairs and security policy. The 2013 NSS said, China is an issue of concern. Over the 10 years, China has significantly grown Moreover, in the Indo-Pacific, Russian invasion of Ukraine has heightened the regional attention on a possible use of force in this area. When House Speaker Pelosi visited Taiwan on August 2nd, 2022, China announced that it would conduct important military exercises, including live fire exercises in six air and sea areas surrounding Taiwan. On August 4th, five of uh, the ballistic missiles launched by China landed within Japan's EEZ. This alarmed inhabitants, Japanese inhabitants, as well as the Japanese government. The westmost island of Yonaguni is only 110 kilometers from Taiwan Strait. China has a large, if not the largest, naval power. China Coast Guard frequently takes assertive actions in the South and East China Seas. The 2022 NSS assessed China's posture as a challenge instead of a concern. As these cases illustrate, Japan is concerned with severe and complex strategic environment it is in. Second factor behind the new NSS is the awareness that globalization and interdependence no longer guarantee peace and security for Japan. Third is the widening scope of national security, which is common with other countries. Hybrid warfare has been waged, for example, in the 2014 Russian annexation of Crimea, and in the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. National security should include such fields previously considered non-militarily, such as economic, technological, and others. 
the boundary between military and non-military fields is no longer clear-cut either. I would like to add one more factor. I personally observed that Ukraine's successful defense against the invasion has driven home the message of the need for military preparedness to deter possible aggression. These factors, if not more, have prompted the Japanese government to make transformational changes to its security and defense strategies. I observe, however, both continuity and changes to the 2022 NSS from the 2013 NSS. Now, let me turn to the NSS itself and share some of the main features as requested. Here, I would like to give six points quickly. First, I would like to note that the main thrust of the first NSS in 2013, namely proactive contribution to peace with international cooperation has been maintained. Second, Japan's alliance with the US remains the cornerstone of Japan's national security strategy as it was stated in 2013. Japan in its 2022 strategy calls for joint deterrence and response capabilities with the United States by pursuing close operational coordination and greater readiness and interoperability. When Prime Minister Kishida visited President Biden in Washington DC in January this year, the joint statement noted that President Biden commended Japan's bold leadership in fundamentally reinforcing its defense capabilities and strengthening diplomatic efforts. This investment will bolster security across the Indo-Pacific. Furthermore, in the NSS, Japan expressed its desire to enhance defense cooperation with the US as well as with as many countries as possible. Third, the 2022 strategy emphasizes a comprehensive national power to shape its external environment. Comprehensive national power includes its diplomatic, defense, development, economic, technological, and inter intelligence capabilities. The concept of uh, comprehensive national power or comprehensive security is not new. Japan has adv advocated a comprehensive security in a 1980 report published by an advisory board to Ohira government that promoted Japanese security by various measures in multiple domains, not limited to defense. Comprehensive national power is employed in 2022 to connect multiple areas, including new areas such as cyber, AI, quantum computing, and other critical technologies in national security. In this context, the 2022 NSS includes economic security. In uh, 2022, Japan introduced the Economic Security Promotion Act. The act aims at strengthening supply chain resilience, developing emerging technologies, and preventing sensitive technology outflow. The NSS also includes cyber security as an important element and alludes to active cyber defense for eliminating in advance the possibility of serious cyber attacks on Japanese networks and critical infrastructure. I must admit that Japan's cyber defense is behind other Western countries and needs developments legally and technically. Also, cyber defense and cyber itself requires rulemaking in order to fit to the technological advances we have witnessed. Fourth, also new in the NSS is Indo-Pacific. In fact, late Prime Minister Abe launched a free and open Indo-Pacific in 2016, which has been inherited by successive prime ministers. FOIP, the free and open Indo-Pacific, aims to uphold international law, to maintain the rules-based international order, and to strengthen regional stability and prosperity. 
I understand Prime Minister Kishida plans to announce the POIP plan in the spring, as he mentioned at the Shangri-La Dialogue last June 5th. As the press reported heavily, the NSS commits to acquire counter-strike capability. The NSS says that the nation needs to have the ability to make effective counter-strikes in an opponent's set territory as a bare minimum self-defense measure. I would like to note that the government has pledged to stick to its commitment to the exclusively self-defense oriented policy and not to become a military power. This is introduced because Japan faces the development of mid to long range ballistic and cruise missiles and hypersonic weapon systems by its neighbors. Japan also faces expanding missile gap between China on one hand and Japan and US on the other. According to the US Department of Defense, China possesses approximately 2000 ballistic and cruise missiles capable of striking Ch Japanese territory. Japan in the NDS plans to procure missiles, including Tomahawk cruise missiles and indigenously developed standoff missile capabilities for deployment in 2026. I would like to note, however, that as described in the 2015 peace and security legislation, strict three conditions apply to uh, use a counter-strike capability. Thus, counter-strike counter capability <coughs> Japan is aiming to own is to deter and defend and not to launch a preemptive strike. Of course, its exact operalization will be further worked out by the political leadership. Sixth, the NSS plans to increase defense spending to 2.0% of current price GDP by fiscal year commencing in April 2027 from 1% of GDP, which has been the self-imposed limit since 1976. This point has also been heavily covered by the press because it involves a question of how to secure enough budget to cover an increase, including a possible tax hike. Even though some of the spending increase will come from the recategorization of existing spending in areas deemed to overlap with national security, the sums involved will be large. The defense buildup program calls for total spending of 43 trillion yen, uh, which is uh, US dollars, 321 billion dollars during the five fiscal year beginning in April 2023 and ending in March 2028. The ruling LDP is now uh, debating how the amount will be financed. Prime Minister Kishida is seeking to raise some of the funds for a structural increase in defense spending from tax increases. Now, how has the Japanese public reacted to these changes? Well, when the 2015 peace and security legislation, which expanded the Japan self-defense forces scope of activities to enable collective self-defense in situations where Japan's survival is threatened, was introduced, the legislation was highly controversial in Japan. According to Asahi Shimbun opinion poll in 2015, 29% supported the law, while 53% was against. In the case of uh, 2022 NSS, Japanese public, public opinion seems broadly supportive of the need to bolster national defense. A survey by the Nihon Keizai Shimbun on December 26, 2022, suggested 55% of uh, so those surveyed was supportive. The same survey showed, however, that 84% uh, were dissatisfied with the government's explanation of why tax hikes were needed. Japan's new sec national security strategy must be operationalized and has numerous challenges ahead. In so doing, Japan has to be responsible for each step it takes for its own national security, as well as peace and security of the Indo-Pacific and beyond. 
at the least in making decisions, Japan has should not lose sight of our basic stance. Now, uh, lastly, let me uh, speak on the impact of uh, NSS on Japan's relations with it, uh, other countries. Uh, Professor Abdurdu has already uh, spoken on this point, so I would be succinct. But um, uh, on February twenty, uh, February second, twenty twenty three. Uh, Professor Nye, in his article to Project uh, Syndicate, observed that some of the Japan's neighbors worry that uh, Japan will resume its militarist posture of uh, the 1930s. But Professor Nye analyzed that uh, NSS reflects Japan's strategic imperative to introduce uh, three documents rather than returning back to militarism. I humbly share Professor Nye's uh, observation. What are, what are the reactions? The United States has uh, issued statements of support for Japan's new strategic documents. Some others in the region and Europe also welcomed the documents. For example, Singapore colleagues welcomed Japan's proactive approach to security as a first step to do more in future and said Japan's position perfectly understandable. They told me that uh, Japan's strategy will keep US anchor in the region. South Korea reportedly welcomed counter-strike capability as contributing to regional peace and stability with a qualification that Japan should understand concerns of its neighbors. This is what Japan intends to do and I look forward to learning views from colleagues attending this seminar to think further of how they have perceived NSS. Europe welcomed the 2022 NSS. SWP commentary said Tokyo's security perspective, which in the past was often narrowly focused on its immediate environment or partnership with the US, has broadened. In this context, the war in Ukraine has highlighted the linkages between Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific security order. Europe uh, welcomes closer security cooperation with Japan because it offers opportunities. It is not only because Tokyo is an important player in the Indo-Pacific, but also because it shows a willingness to take a more responsibility at the global level. I would like to note that NSS underscores cooperation with willing countries for peace and security of the Indo-Pacific and beyond. On the other hand, China criticized Japan for tilting to militarization and a move away from pacifism as a uh, uh, distinguished uh, colleague, Mr. Zhao, is uh, going to speak, uh, I would like to yield the Chinese uh, uh, reaction to him. Suffice me to quote uh, Chinese Global Times on December 16, 2022. Uh, which said Japan's passage of defense documents blinks country away from the track of post-war peaceful development, citing the statement of the Ch Chinese embassy in Tokyo. It also said uh, Jap Japan's new security strategy sparks growing concerns among neighbors. Japan should be aware of these reactions and should communicate further. I hasten to add here, however, in speaking of uh, Sino-Japanese relations, I would like to underscore that Japan has a policy of dialogue and deterrence with China since 1972, when it established diplomatic ties with Beijing. This policy has been maintained. Although Japan must deter threats, Japan has a policy to continue and deepen constructive dialogue with China. In fact, at the summit of President Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Kishida last November in Thailand, Japan and China agreed to resume dialogues. And we have uh, resumed our dialogues. 
For instance, uh, on February 22nd, the 17th round of the Japan-China security dialogue was held in Tokyo. Both parties concurred to continue coordination to commence operations of the hotline between Japanese and Chinese defense authorities. The hotline, in my view, is important to prevent accidental act or act by misunderstanding. Both Japan and China have made efforts to promote economic cooperation as well as people-to-people -people exchange as illustrated by numerous cases, including Panda Bear, which is very popular in Tokyo, in Japan, I should say. Japan intends to continue our dialogue and cooperation with China despite increasingly severe security circumstances. I'm personally involved in people-to-people -people exchange, as well as involved in cooperation with China and the US on climate change for the past six years. In concluding, I have sketched the new NSS from my prison, but would like to underscore that the key is how to operationalize the policies in the documents. I must admit that the road ahead is very challenging. Although I highlighted the transformational changes, I would like to stress that there is a continuity in Japan's security and foreign policy. Japan is non-nuclear state by choice. Japan will soon announce its free and open Indo-Pacific plan, as well as new development cooperation charter to be combined in its implementation with NSS and other documents. I believe we live in a hybrid of bipolarity and multipolarity. Also, we live in a heteropolar world when it comes to technology, innovation, and soft power. I trust this offers opportunities for Japan, China, and other partners to work together in order to navigate these congested waters for peace, stability, and prosperity together. With this, I would like to thank you for your kind attention and very much look forward to uh, the discussion and the views of the colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fukushima, for being, um, first of all, on time. And thanks for this very clear, well-organized uh, uh, talk on the uh, Japan a uh, new national security strategy and, um, you know, especially focusing on the public opinion and also uh, the policy towards China, which I guess uh, I'm expecting to hear much more uh, from Professor Zhao when it comes to the Chinese perspective and how China sees this kind of new move, if we call it new move. Uh, so uh, let me turn the floor to Professor Zhao. Uh, thank you, uh, um, my colleague Hemd, uh, for uh, organizing this event. The collaboration with the Japanese Council uh, Journal Office uh, from the Cobell School and uh, Floyd is here. He has been very instrumental for many years to um, put this program together. Japanese diplomats are here too. And also, I'm so thrilled our former chancellor, Dan Ritchie, is here. We traveled to China together many years ago. <laughs> and uh, so, and also some other colleagues here. Uh, I think that uh, the job uh, for me is to assign to me is to talk about the China's uh, responses to the. To, yeah. Oh, okay, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, Professor uh, Akiko uh, Fukushima has uh, made a very very systematic and uh, detailed uh, presentation of the Japanese uh, perspectives on this new 2022 uh, NSS National Security Strategy. And uh, she mentioned that it's a trans transformational, indeed, it's a very transformational. Uh, and also uh, from the perspective of the uh, Japanese neighbors, in particular, in this case, China is a very fundamental paradigm shift. Uh, because uh, as the Professor uh, uh, Fukushima mentioned, that uh, the, 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 the military budget uh, would increase, would double from 1% of GDP to 2%. It's a, only 1%, but it's a huge and also a doubling of the 
expenses. Uh, and also, uh, Japan tried to establish a counter strike capacity, which also is somehow a new concept uh, for, China, for Japan's neighbors. For China in particular, the justification of uh, this uh, paradigm shift. Uh, although Professor Fukushima mentioned North Korea, Russia, and uh, many other issues, but it's China. It's because of China has posed the greatest uh, security challenge to Japan. That's the very clear message China side got. And also, uh, from Chinese perspective, when I read the Chinese uh, 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 responses, it's a big change. Only as uh, Professor Fukushima, Fukushima mentioned 10 years ago, when the first uh, national security strategy was published in 2013, China was regarded as a strategic partner. Now it's a challenger. So only in 10 years, less than 10 years, the shift is very fundamental. So not surprisingly, China's responses have been very negative. Chinese government immediately expressed its firm, firm opposition to the uh, 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 three documents. And also, uh, it's uh, this strong dissatisfaction with this document because this document from Chinese perspective dropped, as Professor Fukushima already mentioned, uh, dropped the post-World War II pacifist posture. And one very influential Chinese scholar, let me read his uh, writing, uh, which I think is a very well represent Chinese perception, uh, perception that NSS will make China more mistrustful when we will not be helpful for the silo Japanese relations. Uh, as a, from Chinese perspective, the devastating crimes committed by imperialist Japan in 1937 to 1945 remain the most painful memory of the Chinese today. So that's typical Chinese way to express their dissatisfaction. But he also, was comfort from also the public opinions. You uh, Professor uh, uh, Fukushima mentioned that uh, NSS does not reflect a strategic consensus in Japan due to the differences among Japanese policymakers uh, as well as the public. So the strategy is transformed. When the strategy is transformed into public policies, he beliefs, and also I think he tried to tell Chinese government, the opposition can be expected to be substantial if you try to increase defense budget, try to build those military capacities. So he argued that given the no public approval rate of primary, uh, I mean, Prime Minister uh, 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 Kishida, Beijing can bide its time. In other words, I don't have, Beijing does not have to worry that much for now. That's what I think the overall picture I can see from the Chinese responses, which is not my responses, to be clear, my reading of that. But I want to help understand why China responses that way. To understand that, we have to understand the complex relationship between China and Japan. On one hand, geographical proxim, prox, proxim, proxity, cultural similarities and economic complementaries have created numerous opportunities and incentives uh, for any from Chinese side to pursue its modernization through working collaboration with Japan. In fact, the last year when this was published marked 50th anniversary <laughs> of the bilateral relationship was established and, uh, in 1972. So that's a very significant. See, looking at these 50 years, China benefited enormously, and uh, this relationship developed enormously. And uh, the trade, for example, between these two countries, I think last year was uh, about almost $400 billion 
it's about half of the US China trade, but it's a very significant. And uh, Jap I went, uh, when I took, went to Beijing, I met Japanese diplomats. They, they pointed to me, this building was built by Japan, what year? And you can see China benefits, China economic growth to a great extent benefits from the uh, relationship collaboration with Japan in the last 50 years. But on the other hand, you can see historical memories, which has created an improve and uh, which has been constructed and distorted to a certain extent by the Chinese propaganda, which has created anti-Japanese nationalism. Because the Communist Party has used that nationalism as a kind of pillow of uh, uh, legitimacy. And also we have seen territorial disputes. And also we see the Japan-US security relationship. In fact, from Chinese eyes, that's a security threat to China. So all these two sides of issues have complicated this relationship. So I will use my time now very briefly to mention three uh, difficult issues here. One is historical memory. Uh, former premier of China, Zhou Enlai, he has a very famous saying, which characterizes the relationship between China and Japan as 2,000 years of friendship and 50 years of misfortune. In the Chinese said, 2,000年的友好,50年的不幸. Uh, for many, for thousand years, these two countries were neighbors and friends. But since 1930s, uh, uh, um, no, uh, 1895, up to 40, 1945, these 50 years, in periods, Japan became the ultra enemy, destructive enemy of China, this half century. And uh, uh, this was a period, Chinese nationalism became very powerful, striving the Chinese uh, 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 internal politics and also relationships with other countries. And so the Communist Party gained power based on nationalism. Now, after they found the PRC, they still promoted uh, nationalism. Very important part of nationalism has been anti-Japanese nationalism in the Chinese uh, uh, um, discourse. China and Japan established diplomatic relationship in 1972, and they signed a treaty of peace and friendship in 1978. But the no normalization of diplomat diplomatic relationship and also the so-called friendship treaty have never resolved those historical issues. In fact, I wrote an article, a couple of articles, to try to understand the historical issue. Then I found that uh, this so-called friendship has been superficial, very superficial. They talked rhetorics one thing, but they did totally different uh, things. In other words, the 50 years of uh, misfortune has continued overshadow the relationship. Uh, after the end of Cold War, the Communist Party has really fueled nationalism to rebuild its legitimacy uh, in China. And uh, the TV, the media, the school, the museum, everything tried to portray the Japanese suffering as a, a very, very strong historical nation they had to learn. Then China's Chakorn Party has made China stand up, defeat the uh, Japanese. Uh, so that kind of created hatred among Chinese people. The Chinese people were never told about real Japan today. Japan, this little Chinese, People, Japan would never, uh, um, uh, Japan tried to deny those historical atrocities. But Japan is an open society today, and they would not tell the Chinese people that uh, Japan has an uh, internal debate on this issue. Japan uh, has a strong pacifist stay, state in the last 70 years. And Xi Jinping came to office, has launched a new patriotic education in China. In fact, uh, Xi Jinping is having two national holidays uh, in China, which led to Japan. One, were, one is uh, the start of 20, 2013, 
a victory day of the Chinese People's War of Resistance against Japanese aggression, which is on September 3rd, which celebrates the Japanese surrender in 1945. Another uh, national holiday is a National Memorial Day on December 13th, commemorating the Nanjing Massacre by the Japanese Imperial Army in 1937. So the first week today, I watched the TV. Uh, in fact, that day I was in China. I was really messed. I mean, uh, amassed how these kind of uh, messages they send to Chinese people. And uh, in fact, uh, 2014 was uh, coincided with the seventh anniversary of the Japanese surrender. So Jap uh, Xi Jinping stood on the red flag limousine and uh, uh, overseeing the parade of military. It's not a peace message. It's a military type of message sent. The second issue he makes, and all these kind of memories, uh, would not uh, put the internship in peace or easy. The second issue I want to mention territorial disputes. In fact, the uh, Chinese perception and interpretation of uh, territorial disputes are shaped by historical memories. This memory came to two strengths. Uh, one is uh, this constructed. Uh, it, uh, it's a strong sense of grievance, resentments for real on um, all imputed Japanese offenses. Another trend emphasizes Japan's cultural debt to China. So these two trends support that idea that Japan should has debt to China, should somehow um, to follow what China tell them to do. Because China, I mean, Japan has a duty, also Japan uh, owes China's uh, debts. And when there, were, there was a conflict of interest with Japan, the Chinese people always expected Japan to make concessions. That kind of mentality. Just like in the US, it's also the similar mentality. And so this mentality has been very clear in territorial uh, disputes in Japanese called Sankaku Island, Chinese called Diaoyu uh, Islands for many years. China followed a pragmatic approach to assert China's claims to islands, but uh, to deter, def defer the resolution to the future, to avoid conflicts because China was not in a position uh, yet. In fact, during the normalization of a diplomatic relationship, uh, uh, Japanese uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, and Tanaka Rest island issue. So when I said uh, it would not be a good to talk about these issues at the time, let's postpone that. Let's uh, uh, In the 1978 memorial and the ceremony of the Peace and Friendship Treaty, um, Deng Xiaoping was also asked this question. And uh, he uh, joined Japanese Prime Minister uh, Fukuda uh, Takui to and say, uh, let's follow our established policy and postpone the solution for another 20 or 30 years. This is what Deng Xiaoping said. Uh, then further added that the island issue is too complicated to discuss at this time. We may not be wise enough to resolve this issue, but our next generation may be smarter and find a solution. That's what he, he said at the time. But China's policy changed, began to change in the new century, basically uh, uh, coincide with China's uh, rising power, became this, overtook Japan as second larger economy, and China also uh, became the net importer of oil and resources. And in the early 20th century, people found oil and other mineral resources along those islands. Wow, that's important. We have to take clear position on those islands because of the resources, because we have the strength. And uh, so Chinese people and Chinese leaders uh, now uh, become confident that they can resolve this issue or island issue in their own term, the Chinese term. And an incident took place in 2010, we all know that, the collision between two Japanese uh, self-defense uh, 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 naval forces uh, ships and a Chinese stronger. And uh, 
uh, that uh, incident uh, results in the arrest of Chinese uh, captain to be trialed in the Japanese local court. Chinese said this is a violation of the agreement because in the past they would release an open sea. And uh, China said, if we recognize, we will not protest, that will recognize Japanese, ju Japanese jurisdiction over those islands. So that for the first time, I did very detailed research about those process, China sanctions for the first time, uh, economic sanctions, uh, protests, they called the Japanese ambassador midnight six times. <laughs> against the diplomatic protocol. Midnight it called the Capital Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, not only economic sanction, they arrest six Japanese citizens in Hebei province, which is near the military base. They said they are spies. After the arrest of Japanese citizens, Jap Japanese government released the, the, the Chinese captain, the Chinese organized, Erotic welcome, send a charter flight to risk get him back. So that's a total change of behavior. Then another instant, and this is a turning point. Then you can see another instant, 2012, um, uh, 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 Tokyo uh, uh, governor uh, uh, Ishihana, he tried to purchase uh, three islands. Japanese government took a preemptive, preemptive action to purchase them in order to keep status quo. But Chinese government misread it. Chinese government said, this is a nationalization. Japanese government action is a change in the status quo. So they reacted very, very strongly. Ah, and not only protest, and also tolerate the largest protests on the streets, destroy Japanese cars. I thought that's still good. <laughs> But they destroyed it, they kind of burned the Japanese dinner shop, everything. So that's a huge change of the Chinese uh, behavior. And uh, uh, so from there on, China's uh, uh, policy was, was no longer to defer the solution, but find a solution. What's the solution? Solution, the first or uh, immediate objective was to force Japan to acknowledge that the ownership of those islands are contested. It's not yours. In fact, I don't have time to talk about history. Uh, it's how many time you had history of those islands. The final question here is your politics here. And China and Japan be not to opposite camps during most of the Cold War years. And China regarded Japan as the security threat because of its uh, geographical uh, proximity and uh, its position in the US containment strategy. And uh, China has built a very strong military force in the last uh, 30, 40 years. So they uh, have the new capacity to assure to the Chinese public that it will not be complacent in the face of an alleged or imputed, again, threats from Japan. And they will do everything it can to discourage Japan from seeking to play a major role in the Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific, or whatever, militarily and economically. And uh, Beijing has been particularly concerned about Japan US strategic alliance, security alliance. And, uh, its role in Asia Pacific, East Asia. Uh, last year, uh, when um, and Professor Fukushima mentioned that uh, President Biden visits Japan, uh, China is responded immediately, send uh, uh, jet fighters together with Russians, jet fighters. That, that third year, China did that to work with Russia to protest. And uh, Beijing, uh, Beijing concerns on uh, security issue have uh, four aspects. I'm very prepared to mention that. One is Japan's initiative to build a coalition in the Indo-Pacific to resist China's rise, which is uh, in the NSS clearly in the last several years. Second, uh, uh, Japan has become an increasingly important player uh, in deterring China from attacking Taiwan. And uh, from uh, Shinzo Abe, and now uh, Kishida, all these uh, Japanese leaders have uh, made it very clear 
Japan, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Taiwan issue is a Japan's concern. Japan has been clear, China has been very concerned. Third, uh, Japan has joined the US and other Western countries and became increasingly vocal on human rights by nation, including Xinjiang, uh, Hong Kong, and Tibet, which China is very sensitive on those issues. Fourth, the Kishida government adopted economic security policy to target Japan's supply chain security and increase the protectionist against technology acquisition by this had military users, basically talking about China. So that become that makes Japan part of US technology decoupling strategy against China. So let me uh, conclude here that let me first quote the Chinese scholars' response again to see in the context of NSS. Uh, he said, although the NSS will not, will have little impact on the side of Japanese power balance, it will expand the trust deficit between China and Japan, driving the two Asian neighbors further in the wrong direction. That's Chinese perspective. But uh, uh, it doesn't matter if uh, uh, it's uh, wrong or not wrong. The reality has been because of historical memories or constructive historical mem memories, because the territorial disputes which have no solutions yet, and because of the security competition between China and, US and, and Japan, the, and this relationship has got coming from bad, I think, to really worse direction in the next years also. But I really also see hope. For example, last uh, November, when Chinese President Xi Jinping, which I think is something very strange guy, um, he met with uh, Kushida last uh, year. They reached six points of agreement. I think that's a very positive, but I don't know how can they implement those agreements. And uh, the most important part is the communication to understand each other. US and China relationship now suffered hugely from lack of communication. Japan, China relationship, I think is better than in a context, they can talk to each other. And that kind of communication channels should be open and they should find ways to understand each other's concerns and also to play a positive, constructive role. To maintain their relationship. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Zhao, thank you very much for again for respecting the time and uh, and also for uh, this very important historical and contemporary analysis to the China-Japan relations. And I agree with you first that it's much about China, not about Russia. I guess I have the same sense. Um, even if we count the number of words uh, dedicated to China section in this new strategy, I guess that makes sense. W which again, I guess it's it's a, a very rational and very very logical. I mean, um, and also thanks for for playing the history because it's very important. Because uh, you know, I, I lived in Japan for a long time, and I guess. It's mainly about the history. The history usually plays in the background, whether we're talking about people-to-people -people relation, whether we're talking about bilateral official relations. There is always this kind of like history uh, in the background. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, of course, I have so many questions, but uh, I I want to be uh, you know respectful to the floor and and I want really to to start a Q and A session and discussion. But uh, let, let me just very briefly ask one question to Professor Fukushima and one question to Professor Zhao, and then I will open the floor uh, for for Professor Fukushima in the new. National Security Strategy, NSS, um, it, it's very clear that Japan is uh, mentioning that there is an issue based on these new measures with its food security, uh, uh, given the fact that Japan still depends much on, like, you know, on, on the daily food coming from many East Asian and Southeast Asian nations, including China. There is this, what was mentioned, was a self-sufficient approach that Japan will try to adopt in order to, you know, mitigate any kind of future 
security threats to uh, its food security policy. And also there is this mention to uh, the ODAs, the Official Development Assistance Policy, and how it can be used in order to help the uh, national, this new national security strategy. Uh, however, when I read both sections, I, I couldn't really find any real uh, uh, any real empirical or, let's say, any real policies, uh, except just mentioning about the principle of self-sufficient approach when it comes to food and uh, uh, using ODA to uh, um, uh, sustain or to preserve Japan's national security. So if I may ask you kindly to just very briefly uh, elaborate a little bit on the how can this document or these documents impact the future of Japan's food security and also uh, how can uh, the ODA uh, used in, in this regard? Thank you. Um. Am I to respond now or? Yes, Thank please. you very much for a very good, uh, excellent question. And I, my responses, these are now being worked out. And those are the exact questions we are asking now because uh, the Japanese government is now uh, drafting new uh, ODA charter or defense cooperation charter uh, in the light of uh, current uh, international situations. Food security, of course, is an important element. And I have to confess that I'm not the specialist on food security, but my understanding is that uh, Japan has to uh, have certain level of self-sufficiency, but it doesn't make sense logically for me to be full self-sufficient on food security. I don't think that's the way we should go, but we should be prepared for a certain level of self-sufficiency. But uh, in my understanding, Japan places a lot of emphasis on food security of uh, colleagues in so-called global south. Uh, they have suffered from lack of uh, food uh, supply because of uh, uh, situations in Europe and others. And we would like to look into that uh, in the ODA context as well. Uh, we have official development assistance corporation charter Char uh, no, no, a development corporation charter because it's, on it's not only official money but private money uh, are combined in providing uh, development cooperation. And uh, st strategic thinking will be uh, introduced in the charter, I presume, but it is still in the making. And I'm afraid it is too early for me to comment precisely in response to your question, but your question is something we are looking into in drafting new development cooperation charter. Uh, I believe development has been uh, our asset in our diplomatic efforts, and we will uh, regard it as an important element in Japanese foreign policy. Sorry that I cannot give the exact response to uh, your question, but that's my understanding. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And, and one more and final question from my side to Professor Zhao. Um, you know, you, you mentioned about the mistrust that is, uh, you know, growing somehow between uh, China and Japan, or at least this is your reading to the Chinese um, reaction or Chinese understanding or perception. Um, there was this very interesting article uh, uh, that was published in January 17 by Professor Huang Jing. Uh, he's a university professor and director of the Institute yes, for Friend. Okay, great. So he, in, in a very critical article, which you can tell that he's taking the official point of view of China, uh, he, but part of this, I'm, I'm quoting him, saying that as China's rise is bound to continue, the new NSS will have little impact on the Sino-Japanese power balance but it will expand the trust deficit between China and Japan, driving the two Asian neighbors further into the wrong directions. Uh, so you, you give a wonderful talk on the history and, and you know, current affairs. How can we expect the future? Is it true that now Japan and China are moving in the wrong directions as he, as he stated? That's that. 
That was the quote. I also quoted his article. <laughs> uh, he's a professor in the U.S. He has a PhD from Harvard. He is? Yeah, he Harvard PhD and uh, taught at the Utah State. And uh, then went to um, uh, Brookings, uh, eventually returned to, to, went to Singapore and uh, driven out by Singaporean government for helping Chinese to spread influence in Singapore. You know that news? A big news for quite a while. So he returned to China and taught at Peking's Language University, now in Shanghai Foreign Studies University. Yeah, we are friends. Uh, that's why I know his, his uh, uh, positions. Uh, but uh, uh, my reading of their logic of the, the mistrust here, there are several points here. The first and most foremost important is that uh, they believe that uh, Japan now has uh, firmly uh, bought U.S. Uh, contaminant uh, uh, vehicle try to uh, contain China. So that's the this type of uh, uh, national security strategy. If a uh, message they read, because uh, this uh, national security uh, strategy clearly states not only because China threat but also because they have to work with US. So that's the one thing China is concerned. Why is it concerned that? Because uh, US-China relationship now has come to the lowest point since normalization. And uh, US, from Chinese perspective, the US will do everything to undermine China's rise to encircle China with the uh, uh, neighbors. And the uh, uh, U.S. has uh, not only using its own forces, uh, strength to undermine China, so so-called China, contain China, but also build like mind uh, alliances. Japan is part of that. And Japan, these are Japan, maybe U.S. wants to have Japan, but Japan might uh, uh, keep certain distance from U.S. That's what his article talk about. Japan could not trust America. <laughs> America could not be trusted. That's article. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah he, he mentioned you are making wrong choice. <laughs> uh, and uh, so that's one thing. I, another thing I saw, I mentioned earlier here, uh, uh, Japan has also on the Taiwan issue. China has been very concerned on the Taiwan issue. Uh, for many years, uh, Japan's relationship with Taiwan has been somehow uh, very delicate, never publicly mentioned in Taiwan. But now Japan relationship with Taiwan has been so public. And this uh, national uh, security strategy, although they did not mention Taiwan directly, but the, the Chinese mind, that's what in their mind. And uh, so that's a wrong uh, direction. Another thing here, this also tried to talk about Japan's relationship with neighbors. That's another thing China is concerned. In fact, uh, uh, now uh, uh, South Korean president is within Japan. And this, this is a very significant, he, he will come to US uh, this yeah, after that uh, trip. And he will receive state visits, state dinner in the White House. And US has paid good attention to those Asian neighbors around China. And Japan has working very hard with these non-US allies. In fact, I was invited by a Japanese scholar, a Japanese expert to write, uh, he put uh, together a book volume, Japan's diplomacy with non-American countries. So that's a direction uh, China is concerned. And the Japanese uh, Prime Minister Kushida uh, just uh, visited South Asia and uh, tried to enlist those countries working with Japan. And the purpose from Chinese perspective is to oppose China. And these countries have not met their mind clear yet, but Japan pulls very hard. So from Chinese perspective, Japan now has took side Japan, from Chinese perspective, not supposed to side. You benefit security, insecurity from the US, but you also benefit economically from China. That's the position Japan is supposed to be. But China sees Japan moving 
further away <laughs> from this kind of uh, middle position. That's why he said the wrong direction and the, the, this um, non-trust yeah. type of things. Okay, thank you. And and for the sake of time, uh, allow me kindly to uh, run questions and rounds. Uh, so if I might ask you to mention your name and uh, you know just be to the point kindly. And uh, yeah, so uh, if you are interested to make a comment or a question, uh, Professor Hyder. Thank you. My name has already been mentioned. Uh, I am uh, a faculty member here. Uh, and thank you, um, uh, all three, uh, for raising such thoughtful questions and uh, giving very learned uh, analysis. Um, uh, um, uh, I have two short questions, uh, uh, but let me uh, preface them by praising my Japanese mother-in-law. Uh, who is the wisest person on this planet that I know uh, from Tohoku. Uh, so uh, she always says that uh, kuchi wa wazawai no moto. <laughs> you already know the meaning. Uh, but uh, in English, I can translate it by quoting Mark Twain. Mark Twain says, it is much better to keep your mouth shut and keep the world guessing than to open it and remove all doubt. So I think I might be doing something very foolish. Uh, um, but yeah, uh, these are very turbulent times with more turbulent times to uh, come, I'm afraid. Uh, so um, I have, uh, uh, let me just say there are three areas that are of great importance. One is economic, and I'm an economist, <laughs> although I, I, I uh, uh, study history as well. Um, um, uh, and I think the economic side is not going to be good for the Japanese people. Uh, I will just say it straight out. I have some preliminary results uh, that I can discuss if people are interested, but uh, let me leave that aside. Um, the two other parts, uh, and I will ask a question on each, uh, are military um, and uh, uh, international relations aspect on which uh, we have heard some. Militarily, uh, unlike the US claims about missile gap, Japanese claim actually is true. The question really is, uh, does Japan really know what it is getting into? Um, I haven't seen any credible military analysis yet uh, of that. So uh, perhaps Professor Fukushima and Professor Chow, if he has studied it, uh, both can speak to this uh, in as much detail as they want. Uh, the other questions about international relations is that uh, you are probably aware of the debate between Hugh White and John Mearsheimer in Australia at the Center for Independent Studies. I think that's the name. Um, and um, uh, I think they're both right. John says that the US will really push uh, hard on every country in, in the region, uh, Australia included. And uh, uh, China will want to be a regional hegemon. Uh, and uh, that's true. But uh, Hugh says that, uh, uh, well, uh, between the two hegemons, uh, probably it's better to choose uh, China for Australia. And in a way, Japan might have the same kind of dilemma. Uh, uh, so I'd like um, you to speak to that, uh, uh, yeah, because you are both really trained in political science and international relations. Thank you. Thank you. And we can maybe take two more questions in this round. Sure, thank you very much. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, given the history of things and the rise of nationalism, even to a greater extent within China and Xi Jinping, and my experience in Japan also is I find Japanese people to be very patriotic people. And the new NSS seems to be very China-centric in what they're concerned about. So my question is, are there a lot of aspects where there's room for both China and Japan to work together on certain issues where they may increase that relationship? Thank you. Thank you. And let's have one more, one more question in this round. Uh, hi, I'm Luke. I'm a freshman undergrad here. And I guess I'm a question that's sort of similar to yours. Uh, so like maybe when I'm looking at like China, the Japanese relationship, the big thing is like, China really uh, is very much like you mentioned it there, uses nationalism as, na as like a narrative for legitimacy and very much specifically related into World War II and after after World War II and, and that. And also, uh, especially with Taiwan and Japan. And on top of that, and so they often like, do actions that might cause a response from Japan, like increased military buildup. 
stuff like that, which in turn creates more response. Is there, do you think there's a way to like break that cycle, I guess? Break that cycle? Like, um, because on one, it's like a self-feeding cycle because both na nations, like when internally Japan, China uses it for like, propaganda and legitimacy, but it also will always inevitably like lead to responses, like in with the with the U.S. and Japan and a lot of other East Asian uh, nations. Uh, thank you. So let's uh, keep yeah this round at three questions, and let me reverse. Is it okay if I reverse the order? Yeah. So yeah. So let's start by Professor Zhao first, and then uh, we will move to Professor uh, Fukushima. Uh, Heider's uh, questions are well taken uh, here. Uh, since you are uh, a little bit concerned about Japan's uh, uh, close alliance with uh, the U.S., given Japanese economic situation and also military uh, disadvantage uh, in comparison with China, to a certain extent, I agree with that. Uh, uh, position because uh, China's uh, military modernization has been very, very impressive. China has been the second largest uh, military now. Uh, Russia was number two. Now I think Russia in Ukraine has demonstrated it's no longer number two. So China, but China too ha number two has not been tested uh, yet. So uh, economically, China is second largest economy and uh, Japan alone uh, in confrontation with China would be in a very disadvantaged position. But on the other hand, I think I can understand Japanese position for what they have been uh, doing for several reasons here. First, Chinese economy has been also in trouble. Uh, I read so many things about the Japanization of the Chinese economy nowadays. Indeed, Japan had lost two decades, two decades of lost time. And the real estate bubble uh, 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 collapsed, the uh, uh, economy uh, somehow uh, stagnated, and also uh, the population and demographic, uh, demographic uh, declining everything you see in China today. So that's uh, why people are talking about what China the next Japan. There are so many researchers on it from you can you are, you are not economists you must know much better than I do on those economic uh, uh, forces. So China's uh, uh, economic rise uh, cannot be taken for given at this time, and also military forces. I will say uh, China has spent so much on the military. The last weeks. Uh, uh, on this week's National People's Congress, they had put 7.2% military increase budget. And the GDP last year was only 3%. And this year, the target is 5%. So military expenses increase is much bigger than the GDP increase. But how effective those military expenses, we don't know. Nobody knows. And uh, Chinese uh, military has not been tested in a war. China has not been fighting any war since 1979. And that war with Vietnam was not very successful either. So uh, militarily, uh, of course, uh, uh, Japan should be worried, concerned with such huge uh, labor. But uh, uh, how uh, uh, threatening, that's another issue. Third here, Japan is not from confronting China alone. If alone, that would be a problem. Now, I think the international community has been somehow united. Um, China's threat, Europe, and uh, Japan, South Korea, and uh, many other countries. US, although two years ago in Trump years, uh, US lost leadership, and uh, people talk about uh, the authoritarian resilience, everything democratic, fragile, uh, fragility, all, everything problems. But US now has taken leadership role. The Ukraine war, I think, is a very important uh, turning point uh, for uh, the world understanding the threat of authoritarianism, and also in this context, uh, Russia and China. So uh, when these countries put together, although China is a, a big country, second largest economy, but if China confronted this whole uh, <coughs> alliance, Japan would be in a totally different 
position. So that's my take and study Japan's position. Of course, Japan has to be very, very skillful uh, to make their uh, policy confront China and also do everything it could to collaborate with China. So there are two uh, fr fronts. So I think that's also related to Jamie Sharma. And uh, those can debate. All those uh, uh, Australia, all those countries are in a similar situation. Japanese nationalism. I'm not studying Japanese nationalism, I'm studying Chinese nationalism, but I understand these kind of nationalist uh, forces are so strong. Very, I think very critical of Chinese nationalism, but I think it's Japanese right wing nationalism is as extreme as. Um, Chinese nationalism. That's the problem of this two sides. Uh, so they may have to uh, find ways, both sides understand each other, and uh, try to avoid all those extremism. Third question here, but uh, again, about uh, uh, you, you talk about the versus cycle, uh, to them a historical uh, memory and historical uh, uh, legitimacy of the regime. In fact, nationalism has been a double-edged sword for both uh, countries, for, especially, I think, the China context. The Chinese government using nationalism could very often put themselves in a spot and uh, put, I mean, this kind of policies, talking about historical memory, everything, those, those kind of, is already 70 years after, still talking about those. I think Chinese people were not people are smarter than that. And uh, very often also, when they mobilize nationalism, then they become target. Because very often, they cannot take, they cannot uh, 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 deliver what they promised. But if they cannot deliver what they promised on the territorial disputes and on some other uh, issues, then they will be vulnerable to nationalist criticism. Taiwan issue, I mean, Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan not last August. See the Chinese nationalist sentiments, this all put the all thought because the mobilization of Chinese media. Uh, Chinese military will fire missile when Nancy Pelosi's airplane landed in Taiwan. Nothing happened because they cannot do it. The Chinese people were so disappointed. Those in Sham and in the Chinese Fujian province, they were watching on the, across the street. Nothing happened. Then they would cry, they were angry at the Chinese government. So the McCarthy, when he is now he's, he's talking about visit China, visit Taiwan, but he will not meet with Taiwan. He will meet the Taiwan president, Tsai Ing-wen, in California next month. And uh, but Chinese government also give all those expectations. So nationalism is a double-edged song. We'll see how they can go, how far they can go. Uh, Professor Fukushima. Thank you. Um, nationalism, let me walk back from nationalism. As was mentioned, uh, extreme nationalism can be a counterproductive but it is natural for one to love one's own country. And if it is decent nationalism, there is no reason to uh, control such trend. However, nationalism shouldn't go too far to invite discussions, which is illogical. That's my view. On the question of uh, missile gaps, there are numerous studies done uh, in Japan as well as in the United States. And I'm not here to uh, share such uh, detailed information, but allow me to say that Japanese uh, preparedness pales in front of China. It pales more than 10 years ago. And on the choice question of, uh, for Japan, I don't think we are in a position to choose. Uh, I think Professor Tsao has referred to containment policy. I don't think 
Japan uh, takes containment policy. For example, on uh, Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific, I was criticized by Chinese colleagues in 2016 and 17 that Indo-Pacific's uh, policy is a containment policy. I said it is not a containment policy. And in fact, Japanese government, I think it was in 2020 uh, diplomatic blue book that Free and open Indo-Pacific is inclusive policy and not exclusive. And I think we really mean it. We are aiming for cooperation and don't have any intention to exclude somebody from the outset. I, for one, as an academic, is not for uh, containment policy. Rather, I'm for... Uh, more uh, cooperation. I know cooperation is getting more difficult. However, cooperation is the way. I have listened to your argument and discussion about trust deficit. And I do agree to a certain extent, particularly for the three years, past three years, due to COVID-19, we had uh, this uh, great uh, tool of uh, uh, web uh, meetings but web meetings cannot replace face-to-face -face communication completely, can it? Perhaps not. Uh, I'm not only missing pizza today, I'm missing the opportunity to discuss face-to-face uh, -face with uh, colleagues uh, uh, like uh, Professor Duru, uh, Professor, as well as other professors and uh, students and colleagues gathered here in the room. And if there is any deficit created by COVID-19, uh, we should uh, uh, try to fill the deficit a, as quickly as possible. And that's what I would like to uh, do myself. And I don't think it is a day or age of choice because with China, we do have uh, things that we have to deter, but there are so many things that we should uh, work together. We are neighbors and anything that happens uh, between us do affect us both. Uh, I'm, I said I'm working on climate uh, change uh, for uh, green energy and uh, uh, decarbonization with Chinese colleagues and American colleagues with the belief that there are things we can do together. We may differ in other aspects, but when it comes to uh, global issues, there are many elements that we can work together. And that would be a good way to uh, cover any mistrust uh, created. And as a matter of fact, as Professor Tao quoted, uh, Professor, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Prime Minister Kishida met in Thailand at the fringe of, was it the APEC uh, summit in Thailand? And I understand they agreed uh, amongst the six points to uh, resume and continue our dialogue and cooperation. And they have already implemented some of the dialogues as I have quoted. And that's something I would like to see happen further. If we do not have proper communication, our uh, doubts, uh, if not uh, mistrust would simply deepen. And that's something I would like to avoid very much. And finally, on the point about international relations, I'm afraid we our post-Cold War era has ended at the latest last year, and we are going into a new age, but it is a congested water. But if we can gather the nerve and the wisdom of academics, uh, at least, uh, we should be able to find a way uh, to avoid uh, uh, mishaps or uh, accidents by misunderstanding and build a new age. And a new age demands so many things uh, for us to cooperate rather than to confront. And Japan doesn't have any intention to uh, go for confrontation 
even through our NSS. The NSS clearly says to work with the United States, but also as many countries as possible. It clearly emphasizes cooperation with others. And that's the spirit I share as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, definitely, Professor Fukushima, I would love to, in the very near future, uh, I'll be honored to host you here at Corbell. And hopefully, we will have more than pizza. Uh, <laughs> next year. Uh, yeah, and we have now Japanese beer, Sapporo, a city where, where I actually lived for five years. So um, thank you very much, Professor uh, Akiko Fukushima, uh, uh, speaking to us from, uh, from Tokyo very early morning. And, and thank you, Professor Zhao, for, uh, uh, again, canceling the Hong Kong trip. Hopefully, you didn't cancel it. Hopefully, you just postponed it. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. And thanks for all of you for coming today. And I would love, again, to thank the uh, General Consulate of Japan in Denver and uh, Floyd Ciroli and definitely the Institute for uh, Comparative and Regional Studies for sponsoring this program. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope to see you all soon in, in next activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Abrabo, and thank you very much, Professor Zhao, and wish you a very good trip to Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fukushima. I appreciate it. Thank you.